Oh, so we really do have found a disconnect here in the supply chain. Yeah. Um, so I, I noticed there was a need for a mill that would take local materials in small quantities and guarantee the farmer they would get their own materials back. And I set out looking for a place to put it, and before long, my journey took me away from you all, um, back to the Hudson Valley, um, near where I had moved here from, from Western Vermont in 2005. So back I went, the truck flew away, and um, started the mill in, in 2010. One of our first big commercial customers was Taki Stacy Charles, the yarn company, who decided they wanted a, an American-made yarn to respond to what was beginning to happen. Yarn stores were saying to their reps, I won't take as much of your stuff from Italy or China because my customers want something local. So Taki said, okay, if you want something local, we'll get you something local. We'll hire this mill in upstate New York to make some yarn and we'll sell it to you. So they did. And they made it. It's a really nice yarn. A three ply, Aaron Wayne, uh, local Coriadale alpaca blend. And because of this thing called keystoning, which we could go into in depth, but it's in which I pay the poor farmer pennies for their wool. I try to pay my employees at least the living wage, which means more than minimum wage. Uh, the yarn company be beats me down in price, but still ends up buying it from me for, let's say, $6 a skein. They sell it to the yarn store for 12 and the yarn store sells it to the knitter for 24 Well, pretty soon, what knitter is going to pay $24 for a 50-gram skein? So um, that became unsustainable. One day, I was sitting alone at my desk, and the phone rang. This is where you make the noise. Jeez. This is, this is where I <laughs> <laughs> The phone rang. And a complete stranger to me said, hello, I own a yarn store downstate. And? And I know that Taki no longer carries this yarn, and I know that you were spinning it. Do you have any left? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, why do you think it didn't sell? And I said, it was too damn expensive. And she said, yeah, no kidding. And and, and I had kind of the same journey that Mary Jean did, because I grew up on a dairy farm at the other, at the northern end of Keogh Lake, and when I opened my yarn shop, I was like, oh yes, I want to go back to my roots, I want to help farmers, and I want to carry local yarn, and there wasn't any back then, and now I've found Mary Jean, and we can do local yarn, it's wonderful. So, not being happy with just having found each other, <laughs> Gail and I said we ought to tell our story to our friends and neighbors. <laughs> Well, she sucked me into a vortex. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how many of you know Mary Jane. <laughs> she actually started it. I was perfectly happy just making yarn. And she said, well, we should get together for breakfast or lunch someday and bring a couple of our closer friends, textile friends, to just talk about how to get more locally sourced materials into finished goods. So the, the thinking is that there's a, a finite number of hand knitters and weavers and so on, but if we can get all the way to, to finished, if we can get to here, then people who don't know how to, to knit and spin and crochet or whatever can also be a part of what we're doing. So we invited a couple of people that had been either to Gail's shop or my mill talking about this to have breakfast. In, in a diner in New Paltz. And pretty soon the diner said, you all are going to have to go someplace else because we have other customers. <laughs> <laughs> we were taking up most of the diner. In one, in one of our last meetings before they threw us out of the diner, we said, well, there's, there seems like enough interest in this. Maybe we should have, you know how the governor always has these summits, you know, the craft beverage summit and the the Wood Products Summit. Well, maybe we should have our own summit and just see if there's anybody besides the 10 or 12 of us who can come to breakfast if any more other people would come. So we each invited a few people we knew and said, you know, if you know anyone else who wants to come, why don't you have them? And we invited a gal from out in California from the Fiber Shed Movement and um, asked her, uh, how much it would cost. He said, well, you know, if I had 
thousand dollars. That cover my airfare and all. So we asked the Hudson Valley Ag Development Corporation for the thousand to bring it here. They paid it, and next thing we knew, we had too many people. We had to figure out how to turn away because there was only enough chairs for fifty people. Um, yeah, it was. We had to turn people. Which is crazy. That was three years ago. Well, two years ago. That was as we're getting ready for our third annual summit, which means so two years ago, people came together and, and started talking about a whole range of opportunities and things that a group of people really committed to this simple vision of everyone needs to know where their fiber comes from, no different than their food. You know, think about how you go to the farmer's market and you want to you wanna know why does that tomato have a blemish and why don't I just go to Wendland's and buy a perfect one? Well, the answer is because that, that tomato has traveled less miles. It's been raised by um, people who care. It doesn't have a lot of chemicals on it. There's a whole, you know, the whole bit about local food. Well, local fiber, as you all know, is the same way. So we spend a lot of time at the Hudson Valley Textile Project, which now I have a name. Um, talking about these issues and how to do something about it. So that followed um, to, you just can't help but have to have a corporate structure at Sandwell. So we did spend most of year two, the people who used to have breakfast at the diner, um, started to call themselves like a board because the IRS wants to know who's, who's in charge of this checkbook and how are they spending it and what is their mission and vision and bylaws. And I wouldn't mind at some point, if we've got one hour to help you do good, maybe we should actually do some consulting on this topic of where, what we learned along the way and where you all could go and maybe move make you all like immediate friends of ours from the diner and help you get to where you're you're going more quickly as long as we've dragged our way here. You're here. I'm here all weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they have a really long agenda, so we have to go back to our notes now. Um, having an angel investor is really handy. Um, and you have to raise your hand now, but if one of you has $10,000, um, now would be a really good time to give a check made out to, to localfiber.ny to Dana. <laughs> and it really gave us some breathing room to do the next steps we wanted to do. Like we wanted to become a 501c3. But accountants, even accountants would like to knit. Um, accountants eventually need the money to send to the IRS, if nothing else, to become, to become a 501c3. So little things like the meeting room that you meet in, like let's say for some reason people stopped coming to the summits. I can't imagine that, but if they did, we'd still have to pay, because now we have to move to SUNY New Paltz, so we have to sign we had, free, we had a free space the first yeah, so Gail's husband sold it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She'd rather have pay for new faults than the mortgage. Yes, that would, yeah. be, that would be cheaper. But, right, so we're at a very nice venue now, but we have to pay for it. So there's all these things that money really helps with. We, one of our project members is a hand weaver whose husband is a, a tech guy, really good with, with web and social media and so on. But he, he again has his real clients and he has us, so we had to give him a little bit of money to make a website. And it's just all these things end up costing money. So we keep our quote dues, which we have to, mm -hmm. um, quite low. So for a business like mine, the dues is only $175 a year and that includes a ton of different benefits and free lunch at the summit. Um, so you can't, yes, have you applied for any grants? Um, sort of. Um, well, we have a grant writer. One. Well, we, we, when we need money besides the benefactor, we ask the Hudson Valley Ag Development Corporation, who has a small grants program. And right now we have a grant we're implementing for our marketing materials, so for our postcard and our, our hang tags. And that came from Farm Credit East, has a small grants program called the um, 
um, Ag Enhancement um, Grant Program, and that's a real easy application, too. Um, we are looking also has a fund for what small, was that? Orange County also has a fund for small companies, just a startup money. Good. You Orange know County. Do you know about that? No, do you? Um, I, th I think what's going to really help us with grants, and I mean, we've explored a lot of things, is having a 501 reason. Right. That's, that's mm -hmm. why we need to do that, really. And then we've partnered with a couple big organizations, um, like SUNY New Paltz has a materials lab, and uh, we've applied a couple of times to big grants, like New York Farm Viability Institute, um, the 100,000 plus kind of grants as partners in projects, or SUNY Morrisville um, applied a couple of times um, to a USDA rural business enterprise um, for um, research on improving police quality and, and developing markets for lower lower quality or lower um, it's not the fleece that's the quality, it's how dirty everything else yeah. in the bag with the fleece is. So, but so, um, yes, there's definitely grants out there. As to us, the nonprofit <coughs> applying, we don't usually apply for anything but small and easy because we don't have any paid staff. Right, we, you know, we all have Our real jobs. jobs. Yeah. Um, so we, we've come together as, as friends and really want to try to keep it that way. And, um, most of any money we do get seems like it relates back to a specific project that a subset within the Hudson Valley Textile Project is doing. Um, so, for example, um, I, I, we spin for quite a lot of people in the Hudson Valley, and some of them get grants for a certain certain project. But more recently, it what we're doing is, is actually working. So it's no longer at the grant funded demonstration or pilot project stage, it's actually at the business model stage where it, it really works. Where a company sees the lease and fiber source book and likes a certain color of yarn that's in it and says we want to make 150 sweaters out of the yarn that's that color and give us an order for um, 400 pounds of yarn. Yes. Now, that's really working. Now, there's money to be made in that model, and you don't have to apply. You just have to spin it and hone it up and send it to them. Mm -hmm. And so that's, a, I think, the best way we're making money is is not by grant money, but by... It's by networking, and that's, that's what's really happened at the summits, is that Mary Jean maybe Put together a farmer and me, and I'm making salt. And she's selling them. Yeah. She so. sold between Gail and a colleague of hers who makes these little purses at Rhinebeck last year. They sold like five thousand dollars worth of felted sheets and felted items. <coughs> so that's that's what we're really trying to do is make these connections. And I think the branding has helped. So that's what the brand, you know, you can buy a heck of a lot of these little things for a thousand dollars. And then have being part of a branded project. Right, and ferreting out a place where we could get that done. Sure, yeah, pass I mean, anything around you'd like. I mean, this is yarn, this is wool from the Hudson Valley that Mary Jean has spun, and the knits are, are knitted and connected. And tell us about the felts. How are those knits? I have a felt loom in the shop. Um, what happened was at, I think, our first summit, someone was saying, well, what do we do with all of this fiber that gets composted or we throw away? And Mary Jean and I were at a meeting in Ohio, and I said, you know, I really want to stop and... It's right on the way, she said. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't paying attention. I said, just tell me the directions. And so we left Columbia. Is that the name Columbus. Of it? Columbus. Columbus. Yeah. And, and she said, oh, just take I whatever south. And I said, you know, I don't think our house is south. <laughs> she <laughs> found bourbon and she was happy. Yeah. <laughs> it's at Woodford Reserve, next yeah. exit. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. So I visited the felt room and uh, 
Yeah, I really like what you could do with it. I don't know, probably some of you are familiar with it. You may have a, a Lexi or a, you know, a smaller felt loom. And then I knew that I needed to get a die cutter and invest in dies. And uh, so I'm still playing with what I can do, but I can go through a lot of fiber. Mm -hmm. so the, yeah. the fiber that you use in the loom, is it like first processed in some way before getting to the loom? Or like what do you I get this from Mary Jean. Mary Jean. Yeah, or whatever yeah. form she has it in, if it's What's the other one? I don't know. I don't That's know that. usually what it works the best in her. But yeah, it does that, work. That that you have there be spinnable into yarn, or is there yes. something wrong with it? Something wrong with it. The fiber's it's, really short. It's usually our waste wool that we're using for this. A hand spinner could spin that. Yeah. But, but uh, we really spin clean. on the worsted system, uh, which means we take that and put it through the pin drafter and keep drafting it. It's never cut. So if that was on the woolen system, that would get cut right now into pencil roving and spun really tight and you could spin it. But because we're combing and stretching, mm -hmm. um, you need to have some consistency in the fibers. Okay. Uh, so that's why it's become such a good byproduct of the materials we work with at the mill. It's everything that isn't usable in our machines. And we're at the point now where Mary Jean is sending me some farmers that want to kind of see what I can do for them with their, with their fiber. That was new last year. In right. 2018, we, we figured out a per yard cost. And that's really helped the farmers then um, who've had material, including sometimes really interesting spinnable breeds. But, you know, there's always that few bags of ugh. Yep. That just you had you had to put over the bank the same place you put like tractor parts. And <laughs> you never know when you're going to need that part. But that that material was not not usable, and they've been sending it to me. And all all it costs them is we just wash it up quick and throw it in the card, and it goes about like that now. Yeah. And they can make it into sheets and put it on a bolt, like a cloth bolt. And then they can sell it by the yard to their customers or work with somebody in, to in bat form things. or in pelvic form or both? Oh, I always have sold them in, in bat form. But bat form, you are running out of cat beds after a while. <laughs> and, and pillows. Uh, I mean, we do make some square pillows with a sheltered workshop up in Herkimer County. And, um, that uses about a pound of that material in a, in a 16 by 16 pillow. But by Gail making it into sheets, like this is one of our customers, we just were meeting about this. This material was really bad. This was, had no hope as yarn. It's a Ramadale, was that what it was? This was CVM. Oh, CVM. Okay, well it was something that, this was way off the barn floor, you know. When you get close to this, you'll see about half of it is broken tips. You know, it was the parts that would not soak clean at all. And the girls at the mill came to me and said, you know, I don't know what you want to do with this, but this bag of wool here really isn't usable. But, yeah. but if, you, if you look at this, and if I put another layer on this, that'll be real nice. I mean, it's really pretty. It's so interesting. Make a great, make a great mess. Yeah. And, and these are basically pre felt I mean, they could still become done more, or are they finished? Well, um, this is needle felt, but yeah, you can shrink, shrink it by washing it a little. Um, if you go to the Sheep and Wool Show last year, the first year I saw someone demonstrating a felt one there. So if you haven't seen one, you certainly could go and see what it's like. So yeah. you know, felt um, processing the fibers to, like, can you process, like, can you card those fibers? I mean, you must have, right? Like, I you did. card them to that point. <clears throat> yeah, I took, then, on junk day, okay. we okay. take a lot of stuff that's laying around and just card stuff one after the other because it's a lot easier to see what you've got. And sometimes even carded junk still looks like carded junk. And then, then we sell it to the dryer ball people and the cat toy people. Then we finally <laughs> do give up on <laughs> but we try, and that was worth worth the try. Yeah. But 
But that's been a real benefit. That's and it has the, and, 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 and also process really dirty wool that way. Mm -hmm. No. What do you do for really nasty stuff? Can sure. you speak up, please? Okay. Yes, please. Because I can't hear over here. Sorry, I was asking whether this process to make the felt is suitable for wool fleeces that are kind of dirty. We won't put it in our card if it's at all greasy or manure or okay. highly veggie. So we still have to soak it as clean as we can and pick it to get the, the, the junk out. So let me just be sure that I understand. So basically you take this wool, even though it's off the barn floor, wash it, cart it into those kinds of bats, and then she transforms it into the needle and felt on her wool. Right. Right. And then you sell that as yardage on a wool. Um, that's what I'm just going to start to do. But what we've been doing, my friend and I, um, we ha I also have a die cutting machine, and so we've been making maybe coasters or die cutting placemats and just kind of a lot of home deck kind of thing. And she's been making uh, bags and bottle koozies and all different kinds of things like that. Can I ask another question? So yeah. one of the things I see, like, it's a, it's a, oh, but you have this and we don't kind of thought. Um, so you're talking about how, you know, MJ, you, you spin, you card, you get it to, to Gail or whoever else in your chain. Um, you know, I'm just thinking, you, you're right up the stream from each other, right? So getting it back and forth to each other is fairly seamless. Do you work with people who are out, like, a little bit further out and how do you... Like in, in your chain, right. in this I textile understand. project, and how does that get managed then? Well, we work with probably half of my customers or more are outside of the Hudson Valley. Three quarters of my customers, mm -hmm. like this yard goods gal, is actually in Maine. Mm -hmm. uh, we do a lot of business across the New England states mm -hmm. um, to the point where sometimes it almost seems like we're more part of New England, because even Gail's part of the Hudson Valley is right by Connecticut mm -hmm. and Massachusetts. So at our last Fibershed meeting, we had quite a few guests from Connecticut and Massachusetts. Who, and part of Vermont technically is in the Hudson Valley watershed. Yeah. Uh, so as far as how the things move <coughs> around, um, that's a big issue, Dana, because of the cost of shipping. And the more you can refine it, the cheaper it becomes. So sending um, wool off the barn floor weighs quite a bit. And so shipping that in anything short of a, a couple hundred pound bale is not cheap. And so the, the solution that, that we found is when we get a couple thousand pounds of wool amassed, we don't even bother trying to scour it. We just save it. We bail it up. We send it on L LTL, less than truck load, a couple of bales on a tractor trailer. With <coughs> other stuff going to the Carolinas, we get it scoured at chargers and have it come back up on less than truck load and can work with it from there. Like the wool in this sweater um, is from the Finger Lake. We buy a couple of farms Coriadale clips um, in their entirety, and then we save it all up till we have a couple thousand pounds, send it, and bring it back and spin it. How long does it take to gather? To gather a couple thousand pounds? Um, well, it depends if I'm in a hurry or not. If I'm in a hurry, I can do it in a week. Because I know who to call. Who are you going to call? <laughs> um, but if I'm looking for something special, like right now, I'm. Um, gathering Romney, uh, most most Romney shearing is now done for the year, and we're we're gonna get get a couple of bales of that sent out soon um, because I want to have that back soon. So you do your scouring in North Carolina or in on site? It know, depends. I'm not gonna send Mary Ann's order to. They won't take anything less than a thousand pounds, um, so I which is a real issue yeah. for all of us. And one of the things that we're working on at the Hudson Valley Textile Project that we'd like to work with your fiber shed on and Vermont fiber shed and Southern New England fiber shed and whoever, because we need to develop local scouring. Yeah, there's got to be a better way than me amassing thousands of pounds 
bailing it, sending it to South Carolina, and waiting for the truck to come home. Um, and what's the turnaround time on all that? The trucking takes almost as long as the scouring. It's really quick. I've been to Chargers. Have any of you ever been to, to see it? It's, it's just like just like at my mill, only instead of any one of my scouring basins is two feet on a side, any one of their scouring basins is 20 feet on a side. It, it's just the scale. And their conveyor belt is fully automated. There's one person who just pushes the start and stop button. At my mill, there's one person who lifts the, the wash bin out of the one and moves it on the rail and lowers it into the next one. And it's just a, a robot that lifts and lowers there. But doing it at that scale, they're mixing up fleeces from different farms. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you want my fleece back to me, you right. can't do it that way, right? No. No. Okay. thousand pounds. But it works. I mean, we've been, for people from Montana and Wyoming and so on, who they put all, they don't need it sheep by sheep. They just want it from their farm. Right. And they easily have thousand pounds of wool from one farm. So then we can... They would have their own. But at your scale, the thing that I would be excited about doing in, in your region is developing some products that you could sell as branded Finger Lakes coll collaborative product. And so to do that, you don't, you don't need that much from any one farm to have enough to have a run. And that's what, what these are made out of. This is just made from Hudson Valley fibers. And where, where were they made? In Schenectady. So you spin the yarn. We spin the yarn and send it to Schenectady, the Newberry Knitting. And their minimum order is only like 200 pairs. It's very reasonable. I think 40 pounds of yarn is all they need to make this. And maybe even less. They make these hats. Actually, I've been Gloversville, which is weird. They make gloves and Schenectady, <laughs> and the hats in Gloversville. Um, these are pretty basic. Mine are all great. But they, we have another source down in Queens that um, makes really lovely stuff. Sweaters, hats, I mean, really. Um, they're, they're on stole knitting machines, really. Very lovely, programmable. Where's that place you said? In Queens. It's called Simply Knitting. And um, our customers who are going there are really, really happy. We met them because we have a working Stolman Resource Center on West 39th Street in Manhattan, um, which is like the U.S. headquarters for stole knitting machines. And so people who own stoles come there to learn how to use their stoles. Um, they had a little like test knit area where they would make up to 30 of any anything. Um, but the price just, I mean, who, you can't blame them. But they're, they're in the business to sell knitting machines and to help designers set up programs. Mm -hmm. So finding a company that ran their machines. Um, so there's other places that use um, the Shimashiki brand too, which are nice. Um, really nice from very there's a zero waste with them and zero so a lot of them are full full <coughs> shaped garments not just making that angle there it's the sleeves even hooked right on it's crazy whereas the place we're sending to in queens to set in the sleeve it's still like in other knitting factories you may have seen where the sleeves are here and the bodies here and then they put the sleeve on the sleeve sewing machine and add by pick up stitch around uh, but it's, it, we're still very happy with, with that yeah they they sold great they sold very well this is the other thing that has sold pretty well so there's a little card in here about the hudson valley textile project and then we sell this kit to hand knitters. And this is when we were still thinking of trying to become a fiber shed. So we can't meet as a group the fiber shed requirement because of the dyeing. This is plant dye. Um, but at our scale, um, it's not, it, it, well, main thing, it's not sustainable to, to use, quote, natural dyes, uses so much more water and so many more harmful chemicals than to use conventional dyes 
that we can't even kind of just do it. The other part is to have that many flowers, we would have to plow up land that people need to eat, like corn fields and soybean fields, and plant row after row of non-native flowers that would hurt the pollinators that didn't know what to do without their, I mean, it's a mess. So um, we can do this at a very limited scale. But it is fun for somebody who wants a, a real 100%. So we found a designer who lives in the area and had a, a nice pattern. And um, sorry, um, everything. We worked with a, a dye studio who grew the flowers, yeah. everything. And those sold pretty well. It's like a fundraiser. So in answer to do we need grants, um, it seems like it's easier to just sell things and make, make money. This is an interesting project along those same lines. Um, this is the companion pattern to the mitts. See how they've got that same pico, highly picoed edge. But it's just not in those colors. But the same designer from the Hudson Valley. And um, this is from one of our subs, so like one of our partners. It'd be like, you all call it the Finger Lakes Fiber Shed, but then you also have the the Seneca Lake fiber shed, just the people who live or see Seneca Lake, and you're like a subset. So this is the Schoharie Valley group, and they sell the, the, the hand-painted yarn as a benefit for the Schoharie Valley farmers who were hurt by the hurricane flooding. Um, so it's a, a double benefit. So not only is it a local fiber awareness project, but in a second benefit is a community benefit. Um, so the whole idea of doing good to do well um, comes into play here. Can you maybe touch on, and maybe you already did this and I missed it, I apologize, but can you maybe touch on a, um, the other components in the textile project? So there's the two of you. Um, I'm not sure if you did talk about the other people who are involved and how they, what their roles are. How we found each yeah. other, the people who meet at the diner. Yeah, like what, what are their different businesses? Board, how does it all work? A board of nine, yeah. nine people now. And we have uh, one farmer, Paula. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, she's a sheep farmer. Are there alpaca farmers here? Because I never mean to slight the alpaca farmers, please. <laughs> And we have an alpaca. Oh, that's right. See, I forget that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also working, I have a lot of alpaca fiber that I just have to find the right use for that because it felts a little differently. It looks a little bit, a little bit different, but I will be using it. Uh, we have uh, uh, the PhD, the engine, uh, Dr. Nelson, from who mm -hmm. runs the uh, bio, what do you call that? Biomaterials Lab at SUNY New Paltz, and he's working uh, a lot with with microns, and he started working at hemp too, which is interesting. And that's another whole another whole topic. Um, another whole topic. We have Catherine from Brooklyn General, who is <coughs> another uh, retail person, and she is <coughs> her shop. If you ever get to Brooklyn, go to her shop. She is very extremely supportive of local fiber and natural fibers. Um, my friend Kathy, who is a designer. Lily and Laura. Mm -hmm. And Lily is a weaver. And Laura is a professor at Parsons and is the author of the source book. I don't know if you're familiar with her source book. Well, so there's two. There's Helen Trujillo's project that Laura helped to inspire. And then Laura spun off a second source book, uh, commercialized that as a way to us farmers pay to be listed in it. And then Laura takes that source book on your behalf to companies that might want to buy your buy your Laura. Um, it's called a NY Textile Lab. Lab. <coughs> you can look at this if you want. And what, what is her last name? Sansone. S-A-N-S-O-N-E. 
And I don't know if that's the Helen Trujillo one or if that's the it is. That's the Laura one. That's the Helen one. And both of their names are in it. Helen did the micron, the tensile testing and the micron count. So the thing that Laura has now is, is different from that. Um, but it, they started out that was not. Yeah, yeah, I think more general branding. So. Yeah, I'm not really quite sure. I just know they're different. That's one from the website. Can I do yes. it? It's confusing because there are two. Lily, Laura. Yeah, yeah. yeah. she's college. I think both of them general. Yeah, it's very yeah. diverse group. So back to Nana's question. So who yeah. all, what it, was the question? It was like, so who are they and what kind of roles do they play? What, what do their different businesses bring to the textile project? Um, kind of, you know, it's, it, it's a functional group because of all the different things that everybody brings. What are those different things? And I think you started to talk a little bit about like their businesses, but. So there's maybe, like two things that, that happen. One is the corporation, yeah. this group that called the Hudson Valley Textile Project. And just like any other nonprofit, there's a board of directors and they develop projects and activities and do guide and organization. Mm -hmm. And then there are all the members, mm -hmm. all the people like you all, who mm -hmm. are in the, who are members mm -hmm. and who may not have anything to do with the mm -hmm. group, really, mm -hmm. other than paying their dues and being members, but they get together and do stuff. Hmm. And we've mainly been talking about the stuff that the members who pay their dues get together and do, okay. as opposed to projects of the project. Okay. These yeah. projects of the project end up really having to do with just making connections. Yeah. So at our third annual summit, which is March 20th, you're all invited, first 65 people to register are invited. <laughs> Um, we are bringing, um, her is our keynote speaker, Stephanie Wilkes. Um, if you don't have this book, it's really good. It's, it's, um, well, it's called Working Wool in the West. Mm -hmm. It could be Working Wool in the Hudson Valley or Working Wool in the, in the Finger Lakes without, without question. And she's um, really thought and the same journey. She went to her local yarn shop. Yeah. Couldn't find local yarn, yeah. and she was looking at what was wrong with the supply chain there. Yeah. Where was the weakest, weakest link, and how could she, how could she help? And it's her journey on becoming a sheep shearer. Yeah. So, um, but that's obviously a, a gap mm -hmm. to and scouring shearing. I mean, all those. Right. So, as, as as the board, besides besides our summit and our networking. What the board is trying to, to do through a podcast that's going to slowly get off the ground, our website, um, different parts of education is, number one, trying to fill in those gaps in the supply chain, trying to educate people on why natural fibers, and... Um, just keeping the word out and keeping it, yeah. keeping it in front of people. That's basically what we mm -hmm. try to do during the year, besides putting the summit together and mm -hmm. networking and keeping these collaborations going. I mean, there are a lot of other collaborations that you could talk about. Um, Projects that came as a result of the, the introducing people. Mm -hmm. So one of our board members, Lily Marsh, Lily Marsh Studios, is a weaver and had a couple of looms and very good weaver and making, you know, scarves and stuff and selling them at galleries and various events. And through this, she met farmers who wanted blankets made or other things they could sell. Made. She met farmers who just wanted to sell their materials and be done with it. And she met people who were into sewing and mending and other parts of sustainable fashion, sustainable textiles, and before you knew it, she and an alpaca farmer and a dairy sheep farmer had joined forces with a sower, and some of you might follow the sower cow patch, and they had ended up making uh, yard goods, just 
by all these different people meeting at the summit yeah. and and starting to work together. That's exciting. That's very exciting. One thing we do at the summit that people enjoy, and it's hard to manage, but they do enjoy it, is we put a table like this yeah. all around the room and everyone who's working on something or even if all they have is their business card puts it out and then they everyone comes around and and looks and gets ideas and if everyone leaves with having made some new connection something of help to to them whether they're a farmer or an artisan a maker or a a designer yeah designer I mean, we have we have people from the summit that from Manhattan Brooklyn so what, I, yeah. what I hear you saying is just simply getting the people together it's and letting huge. it happen. It's huge. It's yeah. huge. Yeah. I guess I'm, you all are together, yeah. so yeah. <coughs> I did want to say let it happen. I did want to say like I I know it's kind of been somewhat of a conversation, but I was gonna leave like the last fifteen minutes or so for questions, or we can just keep hearing what MJ and Gail have to share. But if there's any questions that are burning. Uh, Please, please open them up. Yes, Nancy. Have you ever had a board member you wish you didn't have? <laughs> and how did you get it? <laughs> 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 no, we, all these board members are, are great. Um, yes, in just, my other jobs, I've certainly had them. It's not to say that we don't have disagreements and discussions. <laughs> oh, yeah. How do, you, how do you end up selecting them? <clears throat> who actually is on the board? And, and who is not on the board. There's a thing called founder's remorse, too. Uh, and we've, we've never had it, but one of my clients years ago in my consulting business founded a really important nonprofit, uh, quite ahead of its time. And one by one, she built her board of some really important people and hired staff, I mean, raised hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they threw her off the board. It was easily one of the saddest things I've ever heard of somebody who had this this dream and this vision and grew it into the huge success and then lost her voice in it. That's not to say that Yeah, maybe that could you in the future. Yeah. Yeah, we could, that could happen. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> who decides what your bylaws decide? Yeah. An organization, that's why forming a corporation, having an organization, really is so smart. Because then it, it's more than just people having coffee in the diner. When you start making investments, um, it really makes sense to have a corporate structure that and I know it's a pain and nobody likes to spend their Saturday morning thinking about corporate structure and bylaws and all. But in the end, I think you'll be glad you, you do that. And maybe you have a governance committee. Maybe there's three or four of you who either A, do this for a living and can do it with your eyes closed, or B, have never done anything like this and think it might be interesting to try. Um, but a small committee to just whip up some bylaws right. and address people. Right, and maybe somebody doesn't like Gail Paranello, and if, oh, this is Gail's, this is Gail's group, I'm not joining that, but you need that, you need that corporate structure so that people realize that it's not just the Gail and Mary Jean show. Yeah, and for continuity, I mean, I almost died recently, and, um, you know, when you're getting yeah. ready to die like that, you really do think through, how oh, have I done everything I wanted to do today? Uh, did I plan everything I needed to plan? And I was really glad that all of the big projects that I'm involved with are also part of corporate structures. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would keep on going, even if I was was dead. Um, fortunately, they fixed me and I didn't die. But um, <laughs> well, as you can see, but it, was, um, <laughs> it was really comforting as you're thinking about maybe I'll be dead soon, uh, to know that you, you've taken the time to make a corporate structure. Um, <laughs> online, uh, hbtextileproject.org. Press the register now button. And see that link may be up now. If not, it should be up this, it will this be up week. this week. Yeah. Yeah. So 
I'm just gonna put a plug out right now. Like that's, we're gonna be talking about a board this afternoon. So start thinking about, I, I sent an email out earlier saying, think about a role if you wanna play a role and think about what it means to have a board. So thanks for talking about that and you're welcome to keep talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> the big thing is having some people on our board or used to being on boards yeah. is they know certain board etiquette. Like you come to the meeting or the conference call when you say you will. Mm -hmm. If you can't, you don't, and you accept what happened that day when you weren't there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's a quorum and it's a legal vote on something, you just keep moving. Mm -hmm. If you don't like what happened, you go. Mm -hmm. and you say, I don't want to be on this board anymore as you're not going in the direction I want to go. And our board is far apart, Greenwich to Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So we do do conference calls. Yeah. We just had a little yeah. debate the other day we on the conference quite, we call. We had quite a debate on a conference call. Yeah. And in the end, we, we just kept pushing around till we made motions, we took votes, we were four and four at one point. Right, because someone couldn't be there, so we were four. Yeah, we, uh, yeah. But we found a compromise. Yeah. And we will meet in person every little while, but uh, conference calls it's written in our bylaws that we can do a conference or a video call. Actually, I think that conference calls are better when we have a lot to do. Because when we're in person, we're always busy looking at stuff and chit chatting. Chit -chatting. <laughs> yeah, so the, our in person meetings are a bit more social mm -hmm. and tactile. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the stuff that you have to have in person for these pro you know how there's two things we're talking about. We're talking about a corporation, we're talking about collaborations that result from people who come to our events. So people come into our events, you have to have me. But corporate work, sometimes email and conference call is the best way to get corporate work done. Um, right. Like you all don't want me to read you our treasurer's report right now. But if you got one in the in the email, you'd be happy to to look mm -hmm. at the treasurer's report and write back and say, well, why did we only spend eight hundred twenty-four dollars of that grant? What are we doing with the rest of it? Right, a lot can be set up and be ready to go when everybody dials in for the conference call. So it's not an excuse to say, well, I can't make it because I'm seventy-five miles away. Yeah, that's great. It's no excuse. Yeah. Um, what's the mix like between producer or fighter producers and um, sounds like you have lots of different layers of the whole business and types of production? I think it's pretty even between farmers, designers, makers, retailers, um, that's a, is that educators. We have a couple of really interesting members, like from the BOCES. Fashion program and, and a couple of Ulster Community College. Because it sounds like that having all those pieces is a part of your success. Is that? And we went and looked for those pieces. Yeah. For the first summit was invitation only, and we brainstormed to to find a good mix. Who wanted? Didn't have the mix. Yeah, yeah. But you've got certainly got the mix here. I mean. Like in such a great diverse area, you've got you've got the resources for sure. Mm -hmm. One thing that we're really um, trying to figure out, and we're going to do uh, work on some activities later in the year, is um, how to make sure the programming we're offering helps to reach some very diverse audiences. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, um, it's a social justice question that it's a lot cheaper to go buy synthetic fiber garments and home decor items at Walmart. Um, so what, what can be done to enhance the quality of life of people in all walks of life with local materials? In a lot of cases it involves minimally processed. So is there a role for for dryer bulbs? Is there a role for these these felted items? What about more mass produced? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, every kid who needs to stay warm in any inner city school anywhere or any very rural poor school could could have access to something like this. So there are ways to enhance the quality of every person's life. Uh, but in the past, our group has sort of talked about that. But we haven't had a specific action plan 
for reaching people of all economic categories, also reaching people of, of all um, ages. We had one of our members say, um, who's in her 20s, saying how much she enjoyed being part of our group because her local guild was not very inclusive. That she would sit at a table and no one else would come and sit at a table with her because they were all middle-aged white ladies. <laughs> and she's a 20-something with purple hair and an armful of tattoos and those big things in her ears. But um, So what? She knows how to do the same thing that all of them do and it's should our they, common denominator. Right. Is the textile. So <coughs> that's that's one of our priorities for this year to see how we can take what has become a very diverse group and spread some of that culture of inclusivity to the people who we encounter. We don't have an action plan yet. That's one of our plans is to work on a plan. Yeah. So we only do have a, just a couple more minutes. Um, I do want to move on at 12, I'm sorry to say. So if there's any like last <coughs> minute burning questions, um, Meg? Well, uh, MJ, you suggested that the thing we need to do is identify a product that we, need, that we should make as our starting point. And you, I mean, there are so many possibilities. <laughs> you know, how do we pick one? And then how do we... Um, select the supply that goes into that product because you know we're all farm producers we're trying to eke out our own identities as an individual I mean and do you just go <coughs> off of something from everyone or do we choose a few breeds or a breed of, of fiber to put into you know right there, there are a lot of pieces how do we my my take on it and I, I didn't bring one I should have it's so pretty we're, um, also involved with a subset, the Southern Adirondack fiber producers who have made um, a couple of different blankets now. And it's a, a collective of all of their wools, long wool, short wool, light wool, dark wool, and it, it kind of ends up looking like this. Um, and so the blanket, picture uh, an entire blanket that looks is this color. Um, and, um, so one thing that works is when it's nothing any of them already make. So you're not competing. So the co-op is not competing with a member. Mm -hmm. So it just takes a little talking to find something. A lot of these felted items no one else had. So just looking for things you could offer that are unique. Um, and so when you're at a booth or you're at a booth or you're at a booth, it won't be, it, it, it's easy to sell because it's different from anything else in your booth, but yet it's uniform by branding, by having this little tag on it. And we have sew-on tags like this, too. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a really good fundraiser, if nothing else. And it also gives you all a common project to be working on, too. So how to pick? I don't know. You just have to think of what would you like, what's missing, what do none of you make. I mean, blankets always come to mind to me because I've seen examples in other places and they're so appealing. Right. You know, everyone needs to throw on their couch. It's got wide appeal. Even if you're not a wool sweater wearer, you might be a blanket user. Right. For example. Or something. We've had good luck with pillows and table runners. Um, mm -hmm. the, a little better price point. Yeah, I was just going to say, you need to yeah. think of price point uh, for sure. And maybe, I don't know, maybe even if that's why we're doing knitted blankets this year. We did woven blankets, about 40 of them. And they, they, everyone, they're all gone somewhere. But um, the knitted blankets are a lot more affordable. Uh, so looking at things that are, are affordable, but even just picking, so these aren't especially a nice pattern, but this place we were working with in Queens knits a really beautiful ribbed Hat. And so by branding, if this had a Finger Lakes logo here, and you picked a color, let's say teal or some, you know, like, I hate to point, but the color of your sweater right there, just pick a color that says Finger Lakes, you've got that color on too, so you all are wearing it. 
But so just pick a color that says Finger Lakes and make something easy and all of you commit to take five of them and put them in your shops or wherever you go or just give them for Christmas. You begin that branding, especially if you also um, make some collateral that goes with it. I think of the hiking trails and all of the different places in the Finger Lakes where they might take five in their shops. We're selling a lot of these in Albany Pine Bush Nature Center. So like Cuban Nature Center might sell something. That's why we made orange. They, they, they requested orange. Yeah. So, uh, for hunters. Mm -hmm. for non -hunters. Uh, right, for non-hunters. Yes. So you're next and you're first. Um, so you'd raise oh, your hand first. Yes. yes. It would be nice if we could do something that... Oh, sorry. She's first and then I'm That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> next, I'm not next. Okay, um, thanks. Then. It'd be nice if we could do something with wineries, because most of the wineries that have tasting rooms also sell other local stuff. True. And yeah, it's a really something that thing you know, for you all. Finger Lakes blend. Most of the wineries have a blend. Mm -hmm. Finger Lakes blend of fiber. One thing I have to do with some of, I've had requests for a couple of the wineries, is every time I do a piece like this, I have a die cutter, so I have to have a die made. And I need to do a die for a wine leaf, or for a grape leaf, mm -hmm. for coasters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, something like that, that, you know, if you can think of either wild cozies or wine, you know, something. Oh, yes. That's a very good idea. That's a very good place to be. And so, packaging is important mm -hmm. to consider. When I was in Norway, well, in Iceland, too, where places you think of having a lot of knitted items, a lot of sheep and wool, it's everywhere. It's at the gas station, the hardware store, the airport. Yeah. There's, there's textiles everywhere. And they're all packaged exactly the same. And they're all branded exactly the same. So even an idiot tourist can, before the end of the week, have said, oh, I'm in a place where there's textiles. It's right there, and it's consistent. And the price is the same everywhere, too. So you, you pretty quick get the message. And you. Yes. And this is going to be the, the last question. And then we can, if you want to chat more, we can chat over lunch. Okay. okay. I was uh, wondering, looking at the branding that we passed around, it didn't, it wasn't breed specific. Uh, is the branding overall, do you say which breeds that are not included in the product? Yeah, the consumer doesn't seem to care much about the breed. And we've okay. done a lot of work trying to talk about breeds and the attributes of breeds. When we get to dealing with designers, maybe there's an interest in breeds, but more often there's an interest in color and softness. Micron count and softness, color, um, it comes out way higher on the list than, than breed. Yet breed, as we all know, is what gives certain products certain characteristics. So it, it's certainly an important topic. But as far as like picking, like how in Iceland, the breed of sheep in Iceland is Icelandic. And they're really into, you're not allowed to import sheep or semen to Iceland. It's only Icelandic sheep. And in Norway, they have spent a lot of time developing a breed called Norwegian White. Their version of Cornell, how we had our own grapes and our own apples. In Norway, they have their own sheep, a Norwegian White. It's mainly, it's like a Gotland Chevy cross. It's yeah. kind of looks like Shetland when, when the dust end of the day. And functions sort of like a Shetland when it's fun. Uh, so there's an option to develop a finger like breed of sheep, and you all, being near Cornell, sort of have that thin dorset cross thing going on from when the, the mm -hmm. breeding programs at Cornell were huge and a lot of sheep were out on, on farms. So that's something to consider is a breed-specific thing. But it's also hard as you get alpacas and hangor goats and uh, other, other things to, to how to include them, which is where, while we're just staying silent on breed and focusing on softness and color. And branding, branding can be a difficult topic. It's just one of our heated discussions always, branding and, and levels of certification and branding. And that's something that evolves. You start, we've decided you start at one level, 
and then become more specific as we grow. That's what we were fighting about on the phone. Because <laughs> um, there's those of us who say, everyone who's making anything in the Hudson Valley ought to put one of these tags on it. So that every gas station or hardware store you go into, if it's, if it's even vaguely made here, or made with materials from here, it ought to have this on. So there's the one school of thought. The other school of thought is you've got to earn this, baby. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to have shorn the ship yourself and known it was milled in the region and, and watch the artisan making every part of it. I mean, maybe the zipper could have come from somewhere else. Uh, but that's it. Yeah. So there's definitely a debate. So there's over. compromise. Yeah. <laughs> so I am going to yep. cut it off there. Um, but thank you so much for coming, and there's more time to chat. You're going to be here for, for lunch, lunch, at least. Do I look like I'll miss a meal? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, MJ and Gail, very much. <laughs>